Honorable the Chief Justice, Honorable the Attorney General, my friends, officers and gentlemen, officers and ladies. When your professor invited me to speak today on this topic of rule of law and the military, he gave me very specific instructions. He said you will have 15 minutes of speaking time and five minutes of question time. I got the message loud and clear. It was necessary that I should show myself, talk sensibly, and make it as fast as possible. So, ladies and gentlemen, I intend in making my presentation in the form of a capsulated nutshell. Well, the topic, rule of law. Well, it all started at a time when it was thought necessary that Kinney's law. When they said Kinney's law, you may well remember that was an era when they said King can do no wrong, King is above the law, and they sang God save the king and made a king live long. It changed. It changed. From what was Kinney's law became law is king. And how did that happen? That happened because the notions were put in with very liberal constructions, no doubt, that nobody is above the law. Everybody is beneath the law. All are equal before the law. The law is supreme. The Constitution is the supreme document. So we have two schools of thought, or rather a transition from one extreme to another. Of course, it did happen gradually. Now, the other aspect I have to link of rule of law is to the military. Now, I, how do I propose to do this? It is my intention to first discuss whether the concept of rule of law is as correct as we lawyers, lecturers, professors, judges, and students would like to place law in its most supreme position as the foremost instrument, because I think, end of the day, we also have a domineering instinct of showing this is the greatest show on earth. And I'm extremely proud and pleased that both the Chief Justice and the Attorney General, both newcomers to their respective positions, are quite liberal, thinking beyond the normal reach and looking afresh. So I'm not afraid to speak quite openly on this aspect. Because if you look at it, what was the most important event of our lifetime? To me, it is defeating terrorism, defeating the uh, end of a 30-year war. Now, if we stuck strictly to the Constitution, would we have won the war? But if we violate the Constitution, there are consequences. So what I propose to do is to bring you to that middle ground, try to show both sides of the picture and see where we should be leading to. Because if you ask me, I do not think for a moment that it is the Constitution or the law that has made us what we are or made you, the, the military, fight a battle which nobody ever thought that Sri Lanka would be able to achieve. I think there's something more. That, I think, is the culture and the civilization of this country. It is something that you have learned from your parents, from your family, from your school, from your religious leaders, whether it is the temple, the Kovil, the church or the mosque, the society, your friends, your wife, your husband, the traditions that we have been brought up with. I think that gives us a much better grounding. The roots run deeper down than the law. And that is why I say rule of law is important. Don't forget it. Don't neglect it. But don't overestimate it because there are other virtues and qualities that are of equal value or even of greater value. Now let us take how does the military get involved in this exercise. 
Now, in doing that, I would like to say that who are the people who talk most about the rule of law? As the Chief Justice said when he was the leader of the delegation at Geneva, it is the West who was trying to throttle the question of the rule of law on us, that we are not following the rule of law as according to their standards. If that is so, let me just take one example, which I'm going to develop today in my talk speech. That is the unmanned aerial vehicles known as UAVs or still better known as drones. Now, we use drones at the, in the war. We had drones who were hovering over the Nandikadal Lake. But what did we use the drones for? We used the drones to get aerial photographs and those photographs were transmitted to our field officers who were in a position to identify or distinguish between civilians and the LTT cadres, whether they were dressed in civilian dress or otherwise, but behaving in such a way which a close range photograph would reveal, so that we were able to identify and single out the LTT and distinguish them from the civilians. Now, the drones presently are used to a great measure in three countries. That is in Yemen, in Somalia and Pakistan. And those drones that are targeting, no doubt, has certain value because when you use a drone, if I may use military terms, you are not having boots on the ground. You are creating waves on the air because you are very safe. You don't put the, the Americans or the foreign force does not get into the country. They stay well away. And from standing out, which is cheaper, which means that there is no political unrest in those countries, they, 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 the politicians are not answerable to the people, they, in a very cowardly way, take targets. And in taking targets, the collateral damage is immense. What is very remarkable is that these countries that are preaching to us the rule of law presently are the perpetrators through this kind of exercise of using drones to target the terrorists. In the process, the numbers of civilians who are being killed is overwhelming, is, is very, very high so that that kind of war crimes are never mentioned. If you remember, how did Obama, uh, uh, Bill Laden was killed? While he was being, the Navy SEALs were operating in Abotov Spad, the President of America and the Secretary Clinton was watching the entire operation on television where they saw a prisoner being taken and immediately bumped off. Now, if any prisoner of ours is bumped off, then that becomes a war crime. But when a terrorist is killed by the West, that is not a war crime. Because if you really examine, terrorism can never be defeated by conventional methods alone. For terrorism, you have to have counter-terrorism. Now, counter-terrorism is certainly not in the book of rules of the, uh, the question of uh, the rule, rules of law. It is certainly not uh, in, in any of the legal doctrines. But it is adopted by all countries. Counter-terrorism is a very, very uh, a method of high degree of violence being used, which is used now in various prisons, in, uh, in, uh, in, by the Americans in renditions in, uh, in Cuba where they have an enclave. But that is not, uh, as far as they are concerned, there are no allegations of war crimes. Just as much, when, you, when they use these UAVs or what are called drones and kill large number of people, 
that is totally unaccounted. But what is interesting is this. If you look at the history of terrorism, they may have eliminated Bin Laden, but did that break down Al-Qaeda? No. Because if you kill innocent civilians in that kind of warfare, it, they have found that the numbers who are drawing uh, Al-Qaeda is able to recruit is very much larger in number than they would have otherwise because their main uh, uh, organization of recruitment, which is known as iCloud, which is known as Cloud, is using these very films that show civilians dying in large numbers, children, women, in this kind of attacks. So that if you, there are two sides to it. If you use the rule of law in its most purified way, you may not succeed in an operation as against terrorism. But if you use it, and then there would, could be still consequences if you defy the rule of law. So there are two sides. It is very necessary we balance it and reach the correct point as to how it should be enforced. Another major deficiency of this kind of uh, you, uh, uh, drones is, as you know, you eliminate the main target. For example, Bin Laden was killed, but that did not eliminate, as I said previously, Al-Qaeda. There are only three terrorist organizations that have been completely demolished in the world by the elimination of the leadership. That is the LTT, where Prabhakaran and the leaders were knocked out. Then there is the Peruvian organization, Shining Path, and the, and the, uh, and the Filipino organization, uh, Al Saif. In those are the only three organizations where a leader has been eliminated and the entire uh, terrorist organization has been completely eliminated, uh, completely wiped out. Except for that, wherever civilians are being killed as presently by the Americans, it has only assisted in getting greater numbers into the movement. The other thing is, when you eliminate a leader in that way, you're losing very, very valuable source of information. Now, we have had that experience ourselves. In Sri Lanka, we eliminated Tamil Chelvam. By eliminating Tamil Chelvam, it was probably a symbolically a very successful operation. But it was much more effective when KP, Patman, KP was taken into custody. Because by taking into custody, you are able to gain far more intelligence and information. So that in this kind of operation, just as much as the rule of law will not help, the, there are certain instances when the rule of law in fact is helpful. Because we, find, we, we would find wherever you can get a leader into custody, you can then through a process of interrogation and uh, uh, investigation, collect much more intel information than in the elimination of but what is the result of all these drone attacks? What is very interesting is the surveys that have been carried out internationally. You would be quite shocked to hear that all the countries, the people of all the countries that are extremely supportive of the America and the wars are, are overwhelmingly hostile to the killing of civilians by the UA, uh, by the uh, by these drones. In fact, the figures that are, have been revealed show that 69% of the Germans are against it, 58% of the French, 57% of the Spanish, 56 by the Portuguese, and 92% of the Greeks, now all these, mind you, are NATO countries. In other words, every country except two, except two, 
are totally against the use of drones in combating terrorism because that they say is against the rule of law. Now, you may ask what the two countries are. Of obviously, one will have to be Britain. Strangely, the other country where there's overwhelming support is India. Those are the only two countries that are supportive on the public uh, opinion surveys that show that they support this American venture of drones. But in India, they have carried out a further survey, which is also very revealing, because most of the survey was done in regard to people from the middle classes. And they have found that no other country has so much of a diaspora or expatriates living in America as much as the Indian middle class. Probably there may be one or two countries in, in, in South America, but except for that, the largest number of uh, 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 Indians on foreign soil belonging to or having relations with Indians living in India are those who have voted overwhelmingly for India against drones, and it's also a possibility, the fact that these drones are being utilized against Pakistan. So that you, we can well see that there are such situations where we are, one must look at when you consider the question of the rule of law. There are two sides to the picture, like in most other things. There is a side which is certainly beneficial, so that rules of law must be observed, but it, you must not take it to an excess and think that is the end order, as the Chief Justice said, the grun norm of law. Because law is something, it is really a factor to me, is a more than the rule of law, virtue in a society. Why Sri Lanka was able to defeat terrorism, I think is a historical truth, that we are a nation who will succumb, tolerate, accept any kind of beating. But the day we are put against the wall, and the final beating is to be, to be given, we are a nation that can rally round, which no other country probably has that kind of courage, and history will show it over and over again. We have never be, we have been beaten, but we don't remain beaten forever. And I think that is the morale that we have to understand, is the chief virtue of our society. Though we pay lip service to rule of law, we must appreciate it, but remember, it is your culture, your civilization that has really made you rich as you are presently. Thank you.